Now we want to talk about a new generation of advocates. Joanne Smith, Executive Director, Girls for Gender Equity and Co-Chair, Young Women's Initiative of New York. Just thank you to the men who got their men in formation, right? So friends, do you know there is a movement afoot? That our native, our Latina, our black, our Muslim and white sisters and brothers are together. That in this country, our most disenfranchised communities and multiracial, gender fluid young people, olders and elders alike are marching, resisting, using our voices, and strategically disrupting the status quo. Trans, homophobic, patriarchal, anti-black racist policies and practices, programs that have inflicted violence on women of color in this country for far too long. As we talk about these solutions, today I have a chance to ask you to ask yourself if you are part of the community and critical mass of people who are courageously challenging institutional racism and patriarchy while engaging in cross-movement building strategies that name gender-based violence as a racial justice issue, as a public health issue, as a child sexual abuse issue, as an educational and economic issue, state-sanctioned violence issue, and reproductive justice issue. Yes, yes, coercing a woman's reproductive decisions is violent. These issues are inextricably linked and connected to our anti-violence, violence against women's movement. To end gender-based violence, we have to not only be against these policies, but we must be for women and girls, for women and girls of color, for black women. We must deepen our analysis on gender-based violence with an understanding that it's a cultural value. It spans micro to macro. It's individual to systemic. That's why these movement, signature movement moments and strategies that are for us are so important right now, like Black Lives Matter and strategies to end state sanctioned violence. Like Move to End Violence, a 10-year initiative to end violence in the U.S. while centering the last girl and being grounded in love. Like Noble Foundation, leading the way philanthropically with a commitment of 90 million, 90 million to invest in women and girls of color. Like the New York Women's Initiative, Young Women's Initiative, a participatory governance process, tackling the crisis facing our cis and trans gender non-conforming young women of color in New York City. The Young Women's Initiative is ready for replication across the country. In plenary two, we'll hear from the New York Women's Foundation about how the courage of community advocates and young women and the city council speaker of New York has galvanized our national funding partners. You'll also, in July, be able to see a guideline and model for how we work with young women at Girls for Gender Equity within our Young Women's Initiative. So on top of that, we have the pleasure of having initiatives like Advancing Equity for Women and Girls of Color housed right here in the White House Council on Women and Girls, right? We did this. These initiatives we speak of, it's our collective genius and loving strategies that our administration listened to. Solutions at to end violence are about the tide and momentum that we the people have collectively generated. It's urgent, right? So four quick solutions. We already heard one from our Vice President Biden. Be for and believe in cis and trans women and girls. There is enough evidence to demonstrate that violence, sexual assault, racism are about power and people with the least amount of power are vulnerable and susceptible to abuse. This abuse is 100% preventable. Two, now that we believe girls and women include survivors in the agenda and policy setting participatory governance practices, right? The most common weapon that men use to murder female partners is a gun. Domestic violence survivors must inform our broader national gun control policies. Let's shift that power by naming and treating gun reform as a gender-based violence issue, especially after what we are mourning. Now that we believe girls and women, and we want them to live, 
invest resources in the strategies that we name as most impactful so that we can create condi the conditions for our girls and women to sustain quality health care, jobs, housing, education without implicit bias and push out. Invest funds in grassroots organizations led by women of color working directly with girls of color. We're the experts of our experiences. We know, right? We know how to center the needs with young people. We know how to uplift our elders and learn from their wisdom. We know that our liberation is bound with the liberation of our black, Latino, native men. We know we're a full community. That's why we launched campaigns like Why We Can't Wait and She Will Be. Right? Because whether we are talking about reproductive and immigration rights, racial and environmental justice, when we invest in girls and women's leadership and organize with an intersectional approach, we are much more successful at advancing every single social justice policy. <laughs> lastly, lastly, we must maintain our movement momentum our movement building momentum that we've worked so hard for. Even with this administration, this day right here is a day that we work so hard for with our president, vice president, first lady and administration. Our organizing and advocacy is transformational. We'll have economic development, health, public safety implications. So we must link arms and when we leave here, call on the next administration to articulate how they plan to center the needs of cis, trans, and gender nonconforming girls and women of color for decades to come. Friends, we must continue onward. We must continue onward with a radical and intersectional queer anti-racist lens in our full truths. We will not yield to the fragility of masculinity, no matter how uncomfortable it makes men and boys and heteronormative or homophobic, xenophobic people feel, because our liberation depends on it. So God bless you. God bless the families of Orlando. Thank you.